Well, thank you, Frederick, for uh, providing me with this opportunity to reflect on the main directions and many detours um, of my academic career. And as I reflect back, I can see one overarching theme and four areas in which I've tried to push the bounds of, of anthropology. So the overarching theme is just the idea of crossing. Uh, to me, crossing disciplines, uh, crossing cultures, and also crossing the senses are really you know, some of the, the ways in which my thought has been positioned. And then in terms of, of areas, I think there are four main areas in which I've tried to make some contribution to anthropology. One of those is the anthropology of consumption or material culture studies. Um, the second would be law and society and the whole idea of a, a legal anthropology. A third is the anthropology of the senses, uh, which uh, is also referred to as sensory studies. And then the final one, and we'll get to that in due course, has to do with um, a concept that's quite unique to the Canadian setting, that of research creation. So I'll be dealing with those four areas in turn, um, but let me begin uh, by telling you a bit of, about my background. And so um, I was born here in Montreal on January the 15th, 1957, and as I subsequently found out, it was the coldest day on record. Um, that could well have, have marked me in a very distinctive way. And I think that actually being born and raised here in Montreal predisposed me to actually pursue a career in anthropology because Montreal is such a cosmopolitan city. You know, you've got the Francophone and the Anglophone and the Allophone and the Indigenous peoples all making this a place of encounter. And I really feel that, uh, you know, that impelled me to take up the study of anthropology to try and understand, in some ways, you know, the mix uh, that uh, is an intrinsic component of the culture of this, uh, this province. So in terms of my parents, um, my father, John Howes, started out as a high school English teacher and then went on to become an administrator at John Abbott College one of the Cégeps uh, here in, in Montreal. My mother, who was a pianist, um, also taught music and actually ran a music academy out of our home on, in Bédurfe, on, on the West Island. So, you know, my, my youth was filled with sound, filled with uh, her practicing piano and her and my sister uh, teaching students in, in the academy. Um, my grandfather on my mother's side went by the name of Johnny Craig, um, and indeed um, he worked for Bell Telephone. And during the Great Depression, for example, um, he planted telephone poles across the province. And as a result, he was recognized for the service when he retired by being promoted to the Order of the Pioneers of America. Uh, so he planted telephone poles the way that other Johnny, Johnny Appleseed, you know, planted apple trees. And one of the mementos that I have of my grandfather Craig is actually this um, rotary dial telephone, um, which I consider to be an heirloom. Try finding one today and you won't be able to find it anywhere um, because they've all been decommissioned. And there's something about you know, lifting the receiver, and especially about dialing a nine that I find deeply satisfying. So 
I occasionally take this phone out of the basement and just practice dialing for the satisfaction that that, that brings. So that's on my mother's side. Um, on my father's side, uh, his father was John Howes, and John Howes was a United Church minister who was stationed, first of all, in Hudson, Quebec, and then in Dryden, Ontario, and finally in Victoria, um, BC. And the way in which I remember him is through this um, beadwork. Uh, and this beadwork um, is said to come um, uh, is said to come from uh, one of his parishioners uh, in northern Ontario. A Cree parishioner, uh, according to family lore, gave it to him. But actually, as I discovered when this came into my possession, uh, it has a different provenance. Um, so um, actually, it wasn't likely a gift. Uh, but my father wrote on the back, beadwork done by a First Nation artist. According to my grandfather, George Van Vliet, the beadwork decorated Louis Riel's tobacco pouch. I have no way of verifying the suggestion of the origin of the beadwork. Okay, so um, actually, this didn't come from uh, my father's father, but rather from his mother's father, who collected it. And as for its authenticity, um, if you go on the internet, you will find close to a hundred examples of Louis Riel's tobacco pouch. So, um, I, I, indeed, you know, there's no way of verifying the provenance. Um, and in any event, what I admire about it is the aesthetic. Uh, I find the actual colors, uh, the pattern, and indeed the texture uh, to be um, really and truly beautiful. So. Um, that's uh, my history in terms of, you know, my parents. I'm very much uh, a Montrealer, um, and um, I indeed went to John Abbott College here on the West Island in St. Anne de Bellevue um, for my, my CEGEP. And when I finished CEGEP, um, I had a choice to make, um, either go into anthropology um, or go into law. And I struggled um, with that um, decision, uh, you know, which would it be? Um, and I chose anthropology. So in 1979, 1976 rather, um, I moved to Toronto and there pursued a BA um, in anthropology at the University of Toronto. Um, I would note that um, one of my classmates was Chris Trott who's also figured in the Bossade uh, series. And then after I completed my BA, uh, I went to do um, a master's in anthropology um, at Oxford. Now, um, you know, I found, however, that um, I could not get law out of my system. So even though I had chosen anthropology and braced it, um, what happened when I finished my, my master's degree was that I came back to Montreal and I enrolled in the national program at McGill uh, Law Faculty. And so the national program is one in which um, you study for a Bachelor of Civil Law and a Bachelor of Common Law side by side. And you end up after four years with both um, degrees, hence the idea of it being a national program. And I found it fascinating uh, to study law. At the same time, I couldn't get anthropology out of my system. So in the end, um, what happened once I finished uh, my law degrees in 1985 uh, is that um, I enrolled in the PhD program in anthropology at um, the University de Montréal. Uh, so I, I was indeed a perpetual student. I, I dragged out my education, you know, and ended up with five degrees. Uh, and uh, in that regard, uh, I was, however, very fortunate to have um, a wonderful supervisor and mentor during my time at the University de Montréal, and that would be Gilles Bibot. 
uh, and Gilles, um, I have always modeled my career after him, especially you know, his dedication to students, to advancing um, you know, their careers, um, advancing their ideas. Uh, he was such a wonderful sounding board um, for my thinking. And I especially remember uh, the um, evenings um, in the basement dining room of his and Alain Corrin's house on Jeanne Mans, uh, where all of us PhD students would be gathered together. There would be 30, uh, 35 people in attendance, and the talk would go on until well into the night. So, um, you know, I have a wonderful recollection of um, my time uh, then back in anthropology, uh, studying for the PhD. So, as a result of my my dual formation in law and anthropology, I have come to lead what I can only describe as a double life. Uh, in effect, uh, I have been a professor of anthropology at Concordia since 1986, so my full-time uh, career has been based in this university. Um, but since 2012, um, I have been an adjunct professor in the Faculty of Law at McGill. Uh, and so I have a foot in both institutions, in both disciplines. And indeed, um, I continue teaching um, at least one course a year at McGill. And so um, I haven't lost uh, my immersion in the law. I've been able to, to keep it going. And I still write um, articles for um, the law journals as I do for, for anthropology journals. Um, so a double formation leading to a double life, um, but a very satisfying life as a result of sort of crossing the borders between the two disciplines and exploring each from the standpoint of the other. And we'll come back to that theme presently. Um, my supervisor for my master's degree at, uh, at Oxford was Rodney Needham, um, and he was the professor of social anthropology there um, until the 1990s. Um, and his influence um, is reflected um, in the topic of one of my first published articles, um, which was called Olfaction and Transition. And you can already hear in the title of that article an echo of a very famous piece by Rodney Needham called Percussion and Transition. And in that piece, which was published, I think, in 1976, um, Needham pointed to the fact that, you know, frequently at moments of transition, there is some kind of percussion. So think of New Year's Eve, the ringing of bells or all those sort of sound makers that give off, you know, some kind of, of sound. Think of, uh, you know, a marriage where, uh, again, uh, the ceremony um, has some kind of percussion element, as in the, the bells especially. Um, or, you know, think of the Roman Catholic Mass, where the moment of transubstantiation, when the bread and the wine become the body and blood of Christ is marked by, and I love this word, tintinabulation, and that's the ringing of bells. Okay. So in each of these cases, um, Needham pointed out, where you have a category change, like from 2021 to 2022, or from two people being single to them being married, um, or indeed this moment of transubstantiation, you have percussion erupting as if percussion provided the irrational spark that sort of enabled you to move from one category to the other. So um, percussion mediates the transition, hence percussion and transition. Well, I was not very original to come up with a piece called Olfaction um, and Transition. Um, it was really you know, straight from the Needham playbook. Um, but what I pointed to you know, was the way in which, well, yes, smell is very often um, a marker of transition. Um, when you're cooking something, for example, that transition from raw to cooked is marked by you know, a change or a dissemination of odor. Similarly, 
um, in initiation rituals around the world, um, often the neophytes during that liminal phase when you know, a, a youth is neither a boy nor a man um, or neither a girl nor a woman, they are referred to as smelly. Okay, so, you know, the smelly neophytes. Um, and their odor is both a sign of you know, being out of place, either one thing or the other, and, you know, the means of transition. And then, you know, come back to the Roman Catholic Mass. And there, too, um, apart from the tintinabulation and apart from the priest, you know, elevating the host, you have the sensing of the congregation with incense. And so here again, that transition from profane to sacred, that sacralization is effected uh, by means of smell. Smell provides you know, the medium for the transition uh, between categories. So um, that was a piece published in 1987, again, you know, directly out of the, the Needham playbook. So Needham was, um, you know, in a way, responsible for my sensory awakening, my, my opening towards the senses. There's another person um, that I must acknowledge um, as having had um, a decisive influence on my interest in the senses, and that is Marshall McLuhan. And indeed, in my last year at U of T, uh, during the winter term, McLuhan came and gave a talk in a college I was at, uh, and that's Trinity College. Um, it was an informal talk in the senior common room, and so I felt very important to be an undergraduate allowed into the hallowed halls of the senior common room. It was very intimate, and McLuhan laid out his theory of the laws of media, and the idea of um, different media of communication um, having the, the effect of shifting uh, the balance of the senses, and uh, that lecture would subsequently be published as the book Laws of Media. I was intrigued by this idea um, of the senses having a history and the balance of the senses uh, being affected uh, by changes in the technology of communication. And so, um, actually it took 10 years, um, but when it came time to do my PhD in 19, early 1990s, um, I decided I would pursue this question that sort of McLuhan had planted in my brain of how the ratio or balance of the senses shifts um, from one society to another. You know, um, are people in so-called oral societies more ear-minded than people in literate societies, which tend to be more visual? Um, we live in a world of instant communication now, thanks to electronic communication. Is it true that we are more in touch with each other than ever before? These were some of the questions um, that uh, McLuhan's work um, suggested in me. And therefore, I resolved uh, to go to Papua New Guinea um, and did so in 1990. Um, and there, my objective was to do a comparative study of what I called the sensory orders of two Melanesian communities. One in the Masim region of Papua New Guinea, which is the stomping ground of Malinowski and Fortune and so forth, famous for the institution of the Kula Ring, and the other in the Middle Sepik region um, around the town of Ambunti, so halfway up um, the Sepik River. One of the challenges, though, was actually you know, getting funding um, for the research. And um, in that regard, I didn't go the usual route. I didn't go to the SHRC or the FRQSC. Uh, we're very blessed here in Canada to have you know, both such uh, entities to apply to. Instead, I went to the Fragrance Foundation. And the Fragrance Foundation is based in New York. And it has a branch called the Olfactory Research Fund. And so I applied to the ORF, the Olfactory Research Fund, um, for um, 
money to finance uh, my trip to Papua New Guinea. And in the next section, um, I will describe you know, some of my findings uh, that were basically having to do with me being led by my nose. I mean, one of the things um, that I think is a bit unusual uh, about my career is that, you know, unlike somebody who's arrived at the senses through visual anthropology, for example, or somebody who's arrived at the senses through auditory technologies, like, for example, Stephen Feld, you know, I came at the senses through a sense of smell. Um, it's an unusual route, um, and it's been quite extraordinary, the process of following my nose for all these years. <laughs>